story last week whenever we we're reading the exodus story i just had things just flooding through my mind of um and you know i've talked on it a few times before about how the exodus story is that picture of salvation right so the children of israel they're a slave to sin it's, well they're a slave to egypt just like we're a slave to sin and then they go and god does these things to bring them out of this slavery and then finally the thing that saves them is that God's judgment comes upon them, and they are saved because they put the blood of a lamb on the doorpost, right? Just like us, we do the same thing. We, we had the blood of the lamb, who we say is Yeshua, our Messiah, who is over our house. His blood is over our house is what covers us from the judgment of God. So then they leave Egypt, and they go through the water, right? And they're baptized in the same way that we're baptized. And then they go, and they learn the commandments of God, just like we go, and we learn the commandments of God. And then when we walk out through the wilderness until we get to the point of coming to the promised land, and we had to make a decision whether we're going to follow Joshua or Yeshua or not, to walk in and to fight the battle or not. So in that, in that we understand that that's a picture of um, our redemption, then those other pieces inside of it we should look at and say, okay, maybe there's some other things we can learn when we look at the details that would tell us some stuff about our redemption tell us stuff about sin, if we understand that um, Egypt is that picture of sin, then maybe we can learn something about sin and how you defeat sin, right? Um, so that's what we're going to try to look at today is um, just that picture of sin. So a few things before, it says, this is Exodus 1, 8 through 11, it says, now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more, more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them, or else they will multiply. In the event of war, they will also join themselves to those who hate us and fight against us and depart from the land. So they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor, and they built the, uh, for Pharaoh storage cities, pythons, and Ramses. So why is it that they put them in slavery? Why is it that the Israelites were put in slavery? Because they're worried about them multiplying. They're worried about them producing fruit right so inside our life how can we apply that to our life well what's the reason why you sin would come into our life to keep you from, from producing fruit so whenever you get that sin in life what happens you quit producing fruit for the kingdom because you're so worried about that sin inside your life so then you see that same picture here so then exodus 3 7 8 says the lord said i've surely seen the affliction of my people who are in egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters. Masters, I'm aware of their suffering. So I've come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Pezuzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. So who's going to come down and deliver us? God said he will. He will come down and deliver us. And he sends Moses in this picture. But we understand in the time to come that he himself is going to come deliver us. So then in Exodus 5, 15 through 23, so like this wording that's used is, used is not in um, lightness. Everything, all of God's words have a purpose. The reason why he uses those words when he describes things. So Exodus 5, 15 through 23 says, Then the foreman of the sons of Israel came and cried out to Pharaoh, saying, Why do you deal this way with your servants? There is no straw given to your servants, yet they keep saying to us, Make bricks, and behold, your servants are eaten, but it is the fault of your own people. So whenever Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh and they ask for them to let him go, then this is what happens, right? So we'll keep reading. It says, But he said, You are lazy, very lazy, and therefore you say, Let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. So go now and work, for you will be given no straw, yet you must deliver the quote of bricks. The foremen of the sons of Israel saw that they were in trouble because they were told, you must not reduce your daily amount of bricks. You must keep building for another kingdom, right? It says, when they left Pharaoh's presence, they met Moses and Aaron as they were waiting for them. They said to them, may the Lord look upon you and judge you, for you have made us 
odious in Pharaoh's sight and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hands to kill us. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, why have you brought harm to this people? Why did you ever send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done harm to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. So this is something that's very common, what happens with sin. And many of you, if you go witness to people, you're going to see the same exact thing happen. You're going to go and you're going to say, Hey, look, you need to be set free from sin. And right when you do that, something's going to come, and they're going to have be tempted, and they're going to come, and they're going to have all these people come against them and say, Oh, no, 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 you need to stay in this sin. You, why, are you, why are you listening to that person? And then when you, and you're living a life, you know, in sin, you start getting closer to God, you start seeing all these things happen to you to try to bring you back into sin and try to make it be where you are going to live and keep serving that sin. And I see that happen all too, happen, all too often. Even in my life, when I see God start working, I see it start moving, I see it start being where it's like, oh, God's bringing people for me to speak to, or he's bringing, he's using me in his life. Then all of a sudden, I start getting temptations all around me, trying to bring me back into sin, and trying to say, oh, Nathan, no, 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 focus on yourself. Focus on what you want to do. And that's the same thing, because they're having the same problems up then. Right when Moses comes to him and says, hey, look, no, no, you need to be free from this sin. Then, th then what does Pharaoh do? He raises their burden and says, oh, no, your burden's going to be much more heavy. You're going to be much more in sin so that you won't be useful for the kingdom. You need to keep building for my kingdom instead of building for the kingdom of God. So, so right when call, God calls someone to start to save them, that they may fall into a greater slavery than before. So when you see that happen to other people, understand that's, not, that's nothing new. If you go and you bring someone, you're trying to bring them to salvation, and you see they fall right back into slavery again, that's nothing new. Same thing happened with, Egypt, with Israel when they were in Egypt. It says right when God's going to use you for good, you should also expect to have someone try to bring you back into slavery too because that's, that's nothing new. That's the same thing that happened to Israel. So we'll go to Exodus 6, 6 through 9. It says, Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage, and I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm with a great judgment. Anytime you see that word, an outstretched arm, you can just go ahead and... Uh, Assume it's talking about the Messiah, the right hand of God, the, the arm that will go out to save you. Um, so here is just that prediction. It says, Then I will take you from my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. I will bring you to the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you for possession. I am Yahweh. So Moses spoke thus to the sons of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses on account of their dis despondency and cruel bondage. So why did they not speak to Moses? Because they were still in bondage. Because it got worse. And they said, oh, we don't want to talk to Moses, our representative. But that same thing happens now. You get, start getting overwhelmed with sin. And you say, ah, I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to read the Bible because I'm so worried about myself. I'm so worried about this, what I want. Um, we'll read then Exodus 7, 1 through 5. It says, then the Lord spoke to Moses. See, I have made you as God to Pharaoh. And your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall speak to Pharaoh that he let the sons of Israel go out of his land. So this is a, a picture right here. So Moses, he was the one who was supposed to lead them out, right? And Aaron was supposed to be the voice, right? He was the one who speaks to Aaron. Well, this is a picture of the Holy Spirit. What's the Spirit supposed to do? It's prophesied over and over again that the Spirit is supposed to lead you out to take you out of bondage to sin. So this, you have Moses, who's a picture of Yeshua, and you have Aaron, who is the mouthpiece, who's supposed to speak to Pharaoh to get you out of that sin. It says, But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, that I may multiply my signs, my wonders in the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh does not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring out my host, my people, the sons of Israel, from the land of Egypt, by great judgments. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the sons of Israel from their midst. So in this, it's also something you see in the New Testament. And the Egyptians are not what's putting the Israelites in slavery, right? Who's putting them in slavery? Pharaoh is. So the Egyptians are the picture of the people, the nations, right, who are looking at you. Well, how are they going to know that you are God's people? It's because you are no longer in sin. And God dwells among you. And that's said all throughout the New Testament. It's said that 
They will know you by your fruit. They'll know you because you are not stuck in sin. Well, that was said in the beginning, in Exodus. That was said that that was going to happen. So we're going to go to Romans 7, 14, 8 through 17. So I've really looked at this probably the wrong way. You always think that the enemy is sin, and we put our focus on sin, right? So in this story, we assume that Pharaoh is sin in our life. And we think that sin is just, just there's something out there, and that's the battle with me and sin, right? Well, if you really, when you read Romans 7, you see that really the enemy is my flesh, my sinful flesh. So, and we're going to read that now. It says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. So we know that the law of God is spiritual. We know that my flesh is sinful. It says, For what I am doing, I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very things I hate. Like, I'm not doing, I don't even want to do this. But I'm doing the things that I hate. It says, but if I do the very things I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. So I agree with the law, but I keep doing these things. So I agree that the law is good, but I'm not the one who wants to do this. It says, for I know that nothing good dwells in me, that, that is in my flesh, for the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. It says, for the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I'm doing the very things I do not want, I'm no longer the one doing it, but the sin which dwells in me. I find in the principle that evil is present in me, that inside me there is something evil. The one who wants to do good, for I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. I joyfully concur that there is a law of God inside of me that wants to do good. But I see a different law in the members of my body. So I see a different law that is my flesh. Waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who set me free from the body of this death? Who set me free from the body of this death? Thankful be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh the law of sin. But see, it doesn't stop there. A lot of times we... We stop at this point, but really you keep going to, to Romans 8. It says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. It set us free from that law that is sin inside our life, that flesh, he has set us free from that. It says, for what the law could not do, weak as it was to the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. So at him, as an offering for sin, he condemned that sinful flesh of us. Does that make sense? It says, so that the requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those, how is it fulfilled? For those who do not walk according to that sinful flesh, but those who walk according to the Spirit. Right? For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So saying that those who are down by this sin, they are constantly thinking about the fleshly desires. And those who are bound by the Spirit of God are constantly thinking about the spiritual things of God. It says, For the mind on the flesh is death, but the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. So if you constantly think about the things of this world, it will lead to death. But if you constantly think about the things of God and the Spirit of God, then it will produce life and peace. So if you say, well, I don't have any life. I don't have any peace in my life. Well, there's a reason. You're probably focused on the wrong things. Because the mind and the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. So if you are constantly focused on the flesh, what you want, you're not even able to fall, walk out the things of God. You're not even able to walk out the law of God because you're constantly focusing on your flesh. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the, uh, from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal body. So the one who gave life to Yeshua will also give you life so you don't have to walk into that sin. 
body is through his spirit who dwell in you. It says, so then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the spirit you are putting to death the deeds of your body, you will live. So you understand that this is a process. When he says, it says, but if by the spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body. Now, as you go along, you're trying to put to death these things that you know are not of God. So it is a walk that I'm walking to get rid of these things. It says, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery, like them in Egypt, leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Of children, we are heirs, also heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. So I just want to read that to understand that the enemy, we often think, is this arbitrary, arbitrary thing called sin. The enemy is our flesh. The enemy is my desires that are not of him. And in this story, Pharaoh is flesh. So when you look at the story, then you must say, okay, what they're battling between Moses and Aaron, Yeshua as Moses, Aaron as, as the Holy Spirit, Pharaoh as being flesh. So then it should help you understand the story when we read it. It should give you a little more insight. Okay, what is God showing us inside this story? So, so now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, When Pharaoh speaks to you saying, Work a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your staff, throw it down before Pharaoh, that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron came to Pharaoh, and thus they did, just as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron threw his staff down, but Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. And Pharaoh also called for the wise men, the sorcerers, and they also, the magicians of the Egyptians, did the same with their secret arts. For each one threw down their staff, and they turned into serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staff, yet Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them, as the Lord had said. So Pharaoh is the picture of our flesh. What was it that kept Pharaoh from letting that spirit free? So Pharaoh... He saw this miracle that was done. He said, oh, no, 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 I don't need to let you free. He said, my guys can do the same thing. My flesh can, can achieve the same thing that your God does. So there's no need for me to let you go. But we see that now, right? We'll see people who stay inside their sin because they see a miracle done, and they'll stay inside their sin. But it's not from God because then you'll see a real miracle done by God, and it will eat up that one that was done by God your flesh or done by someone else's flesh but i see that often i see all these people who are still stuck in sin because they say oh we're seeing miracles we're seeing god make someone's back feel better or seeing god make someone's leg is feeling better today because someone prayed for it but he the guy's preaching to me that i don't have to keep following after god that's just hey grace got you you don't need to quit living in sin well they use the same thing back then it's the same thing back then that they use things to keep you in servant to Moses, and not into Moses, into Pharaoh, to keep you living for Moses, I mean, for Pharaoh. So the other thing, um, you see whenever God calls, you just not turn me up pretty loud, I'm a little hot. No. Um, you see when God brought Moses, he did two things to show him that he was God. He said, well, I'm, I'll show you two things. So one, he said, stick your hand in your jacket, and he came out, and it was what? Leopardus, which leopardus is a picture of what? Sin. So then he put it back in, and he took it out, and it was clean. So then another thing he did, he took a stick, which is a picture of what? A stick you often see as a life, or you see this like the, the tree of God, or the you see that. Um, and then he turned it into a snake, which we also a lot of times associate with sin. And then he brought it back up into a stick again. So both of them are like these pictures of cleansing of sin that God makes as proof of who he is. It's like, I have this thing that I'm going to cleanse you of sin. Before he even does this, that's the first sign that he shows him. And even that's the sign that he shows Pharaoh, is that, hey, I'm going here, showing you this picture of sin, and taking you back up into life, this stick. So then, Exodus 7, 20 through 21. So now we're going to go through some of the plagues and look at them and see what God uses to get us out of that sin. So it says, So Moses and Aaron did even as the Lord had commanded, and he lifted up the staff 
and struck the water that was in the Nile, and the sight of Pharaoh, and the sight of his servants, and all the waters that was in the Nile was turned to blood. The fish that were in the Nile died, and the Nile became vile, so that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile, and the blood was through all the land of Egypt. So when the first plays he does, what is blood? Outside the body is unclean. So what you would use to clean you now is unclean. Just like in sin, those things that you think is going to clean you become unclean. Those things that you think are going to make you holy now make you unholy. But that's the same thing with sin in our life. And God is using this picture. You know, there's things that say that these plagues are to show you um, different gods in the Egyptian world. And I think that's true. But I also think it shows you something about sin. That sin makes you unholy. It makes you unclean. And that is something, the first thing God tries to show you is like, look, that sin makes you unholy. It makes it be where you can't be clean anymore. So then you might turn to him and say, oh, I'm going to follow you. But a lot of times the same thing happens what happens with Pharaoh. He goes back and says, oh, you know, I'll let you free. And he turns right back to the sin again. So we'll read in John 11, 50 and 52. I don't know if that's right. I think I left it in there from last time. So here it says, some, some time, something that is clean that cleans turns into something that is unclean. Talking about blood. It says, after that, in verse 25, it says, seven days passed and the Lord has struck the river. Um, so when God turned it into to blood, it said that seven days passed from when he turned it to blood to when it became a river again. So we understand that as there was sin in the beginning in the first year, and then seven days passed before God then made that clean again. But that's just an uh, extra jewel there for people. And God brings about things to help release you from sin. Just like this, God often shows you the effects of sin for eternity by showing you inside your life little things that bring you and say, oh, look, that's making you unclean. So we'll go to Exodus 8, 12 through 15. It says, Then Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Pharaoh cried to the Lord concerning the frogs which he had inflicted upon Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out of the house, the corpse in the fields. So they piled them up in heaps, and the land became foul. But when Pharaoh saw that there was a relief, he hardened his heart and did not listen to them, as the Lord had said. So Pharaoh, you see this in every time. So if Pharaoh, again, is our flesh, a lot of times we have these things that happen to us that are very foul, that stink, that make us unclean. And we go to God, oh, God, please save me out of my flesh. I'll say, oh, God, please save me. Please forgive me of that sin. And then that goes away, and we go right back to it, right? That's, that's the same picture you see here. Pharaoh does the same thing over and over again. He goes through something hard. And he's like, oh, this is terrible. You made all this stuff come into my neighborhood. You made all this stuff come into my city. And then right when God cleanses it out, he goes right back to it. Because that's what our flesh does. We go right back to that same sin that caused the stink, that caused the uncleanliness. So then Exodus 8, 17 through 19 says, They did so, and Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth, and there was gnats on the man and beast. All the dust of the earth became gnats to all the land of Egypt. The magicians tried their secret arts to bring forth gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. This is the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had said. You know, even our flesh can recognize when it's God. You know, many times you see people, even me, I've probably been it myself, and you're going through a hard time, you don't want to associate that with God, might be bringing that upon your life to get you out of some sin. And we'll say, oh, you know, that's not really God. But at some point, we'll get the understanding that this is from God, that this is the finger of God in my life, and I need to change what I'm doing. And many times I look at people, man, sometimes you'll go talk to someone who might be sick or might be in a very hard situation, and they can see nothing. They can't see anything that they've done wrong. Man, they don't even want to hear you pray for them, nothing. And you see later, after they go through a couple of things, then they get softened. And then it becomes like, you know what, I need help. You know what, this is God acting inside my life. I can tell he's acting inside my life. But God showed that before. He showed that that was going to happen to us that we would have times like this where it takes this multiple things for us to see that this is God working inside my life instead of just being um, having a bad week now. 
So then Exodus 8, 20 through 24 says, Now the Lord said to Moses, Rise early in the morning, present yourself before Pharaoh as he comes out to the water, and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. So the funny thing about this, Pharaoh, he had just now had said, Oh yeah, God, cleanse us of these gnats or lice, one or the other, depends on what your translation says. And so then God, you know, please forgive us, I'll let him go. So then Pharaoh goes in the water, just like what we would understand as baptism, and it's being cleansed off. And right when he's coming out, and Moses goes up to him, he's like, hey, let my people go. And uh, he says, for if you not let my people go, I will send swarms of flies on you and on your servants, on your people, and to your house. And the house of the Egyptians will be full of swarms of flies, and also the ground on which they dwell. But on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen, where my people are living, so that no swarm of flies will be there, in order that you may know that I, the Lord, am in the midst of the land. So I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow the sign will occur. And the Lord did so, and there came a great swarm of flies into the house of Pharaoh, and the house of his servants, and the land was laid waste because of swarm of flies in all the land of Egypt. So you look at just Israel, because everything comes back to Israel, right? And God did this often. Every time they lived in sin, God always sent this people that would come and then attack Israel. And he does it to even nations now. Nations that are living in sin, God will bring people in to destroy that nation. But he always does them. He always leaves a remnant of his people. He always does. And not just in a personal way, you see that in each of these plagues that God brings, he also does the same thing with Israel. Over and over again, I didn't even try to count it out. You see that they leave, they come back to God, they leave, they go into sin again, they come back to God, they leave to go into sin again, and you see that multiple times that these nations will come and destroy the land of Israel. They'll come into the land of Israel and destroy it. Golly, I wish I would have thought about that now to see how many times that they were overtaken by some kind of animal inside this and try to compare it to when Israel was overtaken by some kind of nation. Because I got a strange suspicion that it would always, uh, it would tie out. So, if someone wants to do that, they can. Exodus 9, 4 through 7 says, And the Lord will make a difference between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt. So nothing shall die of all that belongs to the children of Israel. And the Lord appointed us that time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. So the Lord did this thing on the next day. And all the livestock of Egypt died. But of the livestock of the children of Israel, not one died. Then Pharaoh sent, and indeed, not even the ones of the livestock of the Israelites was dead. But the heart of Pharaoh became hard, and he did not let the people go. You know, when Israel was leaving Egypt, why was there a reason for them to stay? They had to come to the understanding that God will take care of us, and that this thing that looks like it's always going to be good this thing that we, it looks like has all the money, has all the, the uh, grain that we need, has all the livestock we need, that God destroyed it all. So then what was left of them to depend on? Nothing. God does the same thing in our life. Many times that we get put into a situation, in that world, the things that we depend on, God removes that from our life. And you see people who lose their job, or they lose someone they're really close to, or they lose something, and we're crying out to God, oh, God, why can't this happen? It's because God wants us to depend on him. God wants us to turn back to him and follow him. And you even see, like, the children of Israel, they're not still like, oh, yeah, come on, Moses, let's go. It's like, until the end, they lose it all, and there's nothing left in Egypt. So they then decide, okay, it's probably better for us out inside the wilderness. Because that's really the decision we have to make in this life, that it's better for me out in the wilderness than it is for me in sin with all this stuff that looks like the stuff that can take care of me. And that's a pretty hard decision because the wilderness looks pretty bad. So then Exodus 9, 8 through 12 says, Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take for yourselves handfuls of suit from a killing, and let Moses throw it towards the sky in the sight of Pharaoh. It will become fine dust over all the land of Egypt. It will become bulls breaking out with sores on man and beast through all the land of Egypt. So they took suit from a killing and stood before Pharaoh and threw it towards the sky, and it became bull breaking out with sores on man and beast. The magicians could not stand before Moses because of the bulls, for the bulls were on the magicians as well as on all the Egyptians, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not listen to them, just as the Lord had spoken to Moses. So what do we see this happen today? What, what is happening? The flesh is dying. 
because that's what God tries to do in our life to get us out of sin. So he constantly allows us for our flesh to be burnt up so that then we might say, oh, well, I want to leave there. Because we say, because right now the sin keeps causing my flesh to be burnt up. So maybe I should follow the creator. Maybe I should follow the one who will lead me to life. But we have to realize that that flesh being burnt up, my flesh being burnt up, is telling me that there's something in my life, there's some kind of sin in my life that I need to leave behind. So Exodus 10, 14 through 17 says, The Lotus came over all the land of Egypt and, and settled in all the territory of Egypt. They were very numerous. There had never been so many locusts, nor would there be so many again. Says, For they covered the surface of the whole land, so that the land was darkened, and they ate every plant of the land and all the fruit of the trees that had held at hell had left, thus nothing green was left on tree or plant of the field through all the land of Egypt. Well, then Pharaoh hurriedly called for Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore, please forgive my sins only this once and make supplication to the Lord your God that he would only remove this death from me. So understand, this is Pharaoh. He didn't necessarily believe in our God that makes this statement. And it's a picture of our flesh that we will do many things, we'll say many things to God to get out of a hard situation. And I've been right there where I say, oh God, I have sinned against you, Lord God, and against you. Therefore, please forgive my sin only this once and make supplication to the Lord your God that he will only remove this death from me. We say that, right? We say, oh God, please forgive me from this. But we have to, even here, God hardens his heart. He strengthens his heart. And he says, Pharaoh, I know inside your heart you do not want to leave that sin. I know that you don't, you're only saying that to get out of this hard situation. You're only saying that because you don't have any food left. That's the only reason you're saying it. But God's trying to show you inside your heart that, look, he's the one who gives life. He's the one who gives food. And many times we get brought to that situation where we lose that thing, lose that thing that might we say, oh, well, I need that food or I need that money, I need this, so then I must trust in him. So Exodus 10, 21 through 23, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand towards the sky, that there may be darkness of the land of Egypt, even a darkness which may be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand towards the sky, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the sons of Israel had light in their dwelling. Now, I, I look at sin, and this is like, to me, is the most accurate picture of sin in any way. Like, I see this world is just consumed with ourselves. We, I mean, really, you can't look anywhere where people are not consumed with themselves. But that is the greatest darkness that you can have. That you cannot see around you the needs of the people around you. You cannot see... What God wants you to do, all you can see is yourself. And that is the greatest darkness that you can have. And really, that is what all sin comes back to, is that you are consumed with yourself. And that is darkness. It is great darkness. And really, you see when God, when he's bringing this darkness upon you, is so that you will understand, man, I want peace. What you'll go out and you'll see. And when you're talking to people, you say, most people have no peace in this world. There are very few people who have any kind of peace or any kind of um, joy anymore. Everything is based off whatever we can buy. I need to buy this so I can get some kind of happiness. I need to buy this to get some kind of happiness. Whenever you have true joy and contentment, then you don't need this stuff. But we keep, us, us, everyone here, we keep trying to do the, these things to find our happiness. But, like, it leads back to darkness. And it leads back to depression. And it leads back to... Now, I hear people say, oh, this person is struggling with depression. Yep, it's because we're living in a world in our sinful nature, and we're turning towards our sinful nature instead of turning to the one that's going to give us life and peace. It says, Mark 14, 37, 38, it says, And he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? So this is when Yeshua is praying, and the, the disciples are supposed to be waiting for him. So then he says, keep watching, praying that you may not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So I, I just, I included that because I understand that even the disciples who are walking right with Yeshua still have weak flesh. Like, and like I, I think God allows me to see my sin 
because he wants me to be merciful to others. And like I said something this week on that, like I still have sinful flesh that I'm trying to get rid of. I'm still trying to walk things out so that I can get rid of this flesh and be closer and closer to him. But in understanding that as we get out of this sin, then we're going to see less and less of those curses that come upon us. And then you're going to see more and more joy, more and more peace. And like people who are truly close to God, they have great peace no matter the circumstance. But even them, they, have, they said their flesh is weak, even though the spirit is willing. So then Exodus 12, 23 through 24. So this is the, for the Lord will pass through this and smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lentils and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door, will not allow the destroyer to come into your house to smite you. And you shall observe this event as an ordinance for you and your children forever. So he's talking about Passover. He's saying, you know, when the destroyer comes, when the judgment of God comes, the thing that's going to save you is that you had the blood on your doorpost, right? We talked about that. So then there's another verse. Right after this, Exodus 12, 29 and 30 says, Now it came about at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt for the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captives who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborns of the cattle. Pharaoh arose in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was no home where there was not someone dead. So one thing that you see in this, uh, the Passover lamb saved you from the wrath of God, but the death of the firstborn of the king is what freed them from slavery. So understand this. So whenever Pharaoh, if his firstborn doesn't die, or if he doesn't see the firstborn die, is he going to be like, oh, yeah, you guys need to leave? If it just happens, he, no, he's not going to do that. It's only that the firstborn actually dies that he says, oh, yeah, you guys need to get out of here because this has been too tr troublesome for me. I am in such pain because my firstborn has died. You must leave. Well, again, with our salvation, the only reason we have salvation is because the firstborn of the king died. And like I read something not too long ago, a guy was saying, um, He's trying to prove that all you need is repentance. That's the only thing you need for salvation is repentance. Um, he's saying, like, all throughout Scripture, you know this, like, it's been like a process thing has made it be that you need Jesus for this salvation. But when you look back at the story here, without that firstborn dying, without the blood on the doorpost, then we don't have salvation. Like, we're not saved from that sin unless there is the the firstborn dies, he's not going to let them go. Unless the blood is on our doorpost, do we miss the punishment from God? Or that's the only way we have salvation. So then it says, you can put the blood on the doorpost, but if you don't follow Moses or Yeshua, you will stay in Egypt. So you can say, oh, I believe that this works. And you can sit inside that house while everybody else leaves. But you're going to still be in Egypt. So you have to leave that sin. You have to make a decision that, I, man, I don't want to keep serving this sin. I don't want to keep living in this sin. And I say that in the sense of bitterness, hardness of heart, unforgiveness, like speaking evil of others. We have to leave that behind. We have to leave it behind about everybody. We have to be so different from anybody else. Lust of this world and the things of this world, like we have to leave that behind. So I, I left this last one. So the firstborn died just like all the firstborn were not chosen to get the inheritance. Because uh, you look, um, Yeshua, when he dies, right? So he didn't really get the inheritance. It's when he comes the second time that he gets the inheritance. So there's a picture there that you can understand something about what is to come. Whenever you see that picture of um, Jacob and Esau and Ephraim and Manasseh, the firstborn didn't get the inheritance. It was always the second one. Just like in the first time, it shows this picture of the Messiah. When he comes, he doesn't get the inheritance the first time. He gets it the second time he comes. Does that make sense? So John 1, 5 through 10 says, This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So let me read that again. It says, if we say that we have fellowship with him, and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. It says, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, so, and we understand that, what is the light? The word is 
a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Yeshua, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So we say, well, I don't have any sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what the hardest part about getting rid of sin is that you have to humble yourself to confess it to somebody else. If not, you're just going to keep staying without that sin. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So I'll, I was supposed to include one more in there. And I have to go to it. It's the same passage that Layman read last week. Um, but I, I saw it with different eyes whenever I was listening to um, him teach. And I'll give you a chance to turn to it. Um, Hebrews 12. Whenever Layman read it last week, I had already written it down in my notes or something to include to teach this week. And I was like, oh, man, I can't believe he included that in there. Um, so I'll start. Hebrews 12, 1 says, so I, I use a new NASB, but we either read with the New King James. But it says, therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumberment and the sin which is so easily entangled with us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endures the cross, despises the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So I'll tell you, like I always hear people use these statements, like fix your eyes on Jesus, fix your eyes upon Jesus, right? I always hear people say that saying, but it's like, it's kind of like a cliche that people use. Hey, you just need to fix your eyes up on Jesus right now. I know you're going through something hard. You just need to fix your eyes on Jesus. It's kind of like a cliche. But really, if you're trying to get through sin, you must understand that there's a great cloud of witnesses. Many people who live before you have lived a righteous life that can show you that you can live a righteous life, that you can get through sin, that you can get it out of your life. There's been many cl a great cloud of witnesses who have done it before you. The way to do it is to fix your eyes on him. And when I say that, I mean that you must continually think about what it is that he has done, not in the sense of like, just think about him dying on the cross for you, Nathan, you're going to get it. That, that, doesn't, that does nothing for me. But if I will go and I'll read his word, and I'll pray, and I'll pray for people who I know are in need, it's just like that message that Matt gave a little while ago about the name of Yeshua. That he's talking about the character of Yeshua, that when you go pray inside his character, that's what makes a difference. When you go acting his character inside his name, it's you are acting the way that he would act. When it's saying to fix your eyes upon him, it's saying that you should then go think about the things that he thinks about. Go act on the things that he would act on. And whenever you're thinking about doing the work of God, then you're going to leave the sin behind. It's like, I was thinking sometimes you might go, I had someone that really kind of you know, got me a little frustrated the other day. Whenever I started praying for that person, then... I, I quit being so frustrated with that person because then my heart changed with just my pride and someone trying to embarrass me to, okay, thank God have mercy on this person. So then that sin that I had of bitterness because I was letting this bitterness come into my heart, I kept being like, okay, I, I'm really not happy with this person, changed to be that I'm concerned for this person and I want God to work with this person. And that changes, that sin then leaves me. That I don't have that sin. So in our life, if you want to get rid of sin, then you must fix your eyes upon him. You must start thinking on the things that he does. What does he do for me? That he would pray upon my behalf. So then if I'm going to do something different, then I must start acting differently. If I want to like, get rid of sin, then I have to act differently. I've got to focus on those things. Because I tell you, most sin comes back to one thing. Myself. And me focusing on me. What can I get for me? Oh. That's a beautiful woman. I want to think about that woman because I'm trying to satisfy my flesh. Or this person talked evil of me. So I'm going to think about my flesh of how you shamed me. I'm going to keep thinking about that, and it's going to soul inside me. Then I'm going to remain angry at you. It's not going to be righteous angry. It's going to be sin because I was thinking about myself. But that's every sin. We go back and we think about ourselves. How does this affect me? Oh, you made me look bad. So now I keep thinking about those things, how you made me look bad. 
or keep thinking about how you did something wrong and it's not righteous. So if you want to test if something is righteous or not, you think, is it for you or is it for him or is it for the kingdom? That's how you test if there's if righteous anger or not. Is it about you or is it about for the kingdom? Because a lot of times if you really question, if you really ask about it, you will realize that many times your anger is about yourself. It's really about me, what you've done me wrong. Or if we have some kind of, even with when we complain, we complain and complain. You see where God will oftentimes punish them because they're complaining. Because all we're thinking about is ourself. I'm complaining about my situation. This is so bad. Instead of thinking, oh, God has had me here for a reason. And he's trying to work something out of me. I should then, instead of complaining about it, I should be thinking, well, what does God have here for me? Because always, that sin always comes back to my flesh. It always comes back to me. And that's the battle that is shown in that scripture with Pharaoh. Is that do I think about myself? Am I trying to repent for myself because I want to save my flesh? Or am I repenting because I want to follow the Messiah? Am I repenting because I want freedom from the sin? Why am I repenting? Look back and say, okay, is it just to say this because I'm, I'm going through something really hard right now and I just really want to be out of this hard time? God, oh, please forgive me from the sin. It's really hard. That's my flesh repenting. That's Pharaoh repenting. That's what that is. That's not, that's not the spirit repenting. So then you must really search inside yourself. Am I acting like Pharaoh? Or am I going to go and repent because I understand that brings me in relationship with the Father and I'm going to turn my eyes to him. So we'll keep reading. <clears throat> Verse 3 says, For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Considering Yeshua, who was perfect, who endured by sinners when he was perfect on your behalf. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. I read that and I weep inside. Because, man, I've never resisted to the point of blood I've never like not talked bad about someone to the point of blood but him man he could have just given up said ah sorry Pharaoh I mean sorry uh, Caesar I'm I'm done here and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons as sons my sons do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord nor faint when you were reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. So in this story, you see that who is inside the first punishment? Israel is. God punishes them so that they will say, oh, I want out of this place too. This place is bringing curses upon my life. I don't want to be in this place. Same thing with us. Said it is for discipline that you endure God's deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. So essentially, if if you aren't punished from your sin and you don't see God punishing you for your sin, you're an illegitimate child. Like, whenever I sin, I get very I always understand something's about to come. And not to be in fear, because I understand God is trying to turn me away from my sin. So like for us, when you sin, you should understand, oh, all right, something's coming with this, because I understood I shouldn't have done that. Just like my child, when they do something wrong, they often run off, because they understand something's coming with it. But for me, as a father, I just want them to quit doing that. Like, because I love them, I'm trying to turn them away from that, so when they grow up, they'll be loving and kind merciful <clears throat> so we're in 8 but if you are without discipline of which all have become partakers and you are illegitimate children and not sons furthermore we had earthly fathers to discipline us and we respected them shall we not much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live for they disciplined us for a short time as seems best to them but he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness so why does he discipline us? So we can be holy as he is holy. All dis discipline from the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields a peaceful fruit of righteousness. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak, 
and the knees that are feeble, and make straight path for your feet, so that the limbs which are lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. So essentially saying, strengthen the legs that are walking on that straight path. You yourself, strengthen them. Read his word, pray, get close to the Father. So when you are walking down that path, you will walk with straight legs, and you will walk on the path straight, not with feeble knees. I have that verse posted in front of my computer at my office, because I always think, Strengthen your knees, strengthen your legs. So we'll end. Don't go back to sin because it's trying to keep you to be unfruitful for the kingdom. Don't go back to it. The whole purpose is so that you won't be used by God. The whole purpose is like, oh, if I can get them back into sin, then he, they're not going to build up this kingdom to fight against me. So in you, when you think about that, it kind of thinks like, man, I want to be used by the kingdom of God. I want to be used by God, so I'm not going to have this sin in my life. It says you have to keep your eyes on the example. Like you have to keep looking to Yeshua. You have to keep looking to him. Whenever we start looking at the world and what you put in to your life, if you keep putting in things into your life that doesn't look like him, then that's what's going to come out. So like if you're constantly talking about one thing and you're not talking about him, then it's probably because you put a lot of things inside of them that's not about him. And that's going to make a big difference about what comes out. So, and I see that w with my life, and I see that with lots of other people's life. You usually don't have to tell me anything about you reading scripture or not, or you praying or not, because I can usually tell by what's coming out of your mouth. If you're constantly talking about the same thing that's not about him, I understand that's what you've been feeding to yourself for a long time. But he can see the same thing. So you can see it with your kids. This is what you've been feeding yourself. So you can look at yourself, and if you can take an accurate assessment of yourself, you say, what's coming out of my mouth? What am I always talking about? What's always important inside of my life? And you can tell inside your life if you've been putting in the word of God, if you've been praying. If you've been, if you're, so if you've been praying for other people, you're going to be merciful because you've been praying for them. If you hadn't been, you're not going to be very merciful. So when I'm not merciful, I usually know it's because I'm not praying for people. If, if I'm not spitting out the word of God when I'm talking to people who are going through hard stuff, it's probably because it hadn't been put inside my heart, and that's not the first thing I'm going to when I hear something from somebody else. So we got to take an accurate assessment of ourselves. Because look, pretty soon it's going to be Passover season again. Pretty soon it's going to be the time that we stand before God again. So we have to continue to prepare ourselves. Hey, it's going to come as a thief in the night. So I don't know if that was a good one or a bad one, but um, hopefully it blesses you guys. If y'all would join me in prayer. <clears throat> Father, you are a great king. You are mighty and you are wonderful, and we need your son. Because, Father, I still battle with flesh and blood, and I'm still battling with my flesh, Father. And I just, I, I need you. I need your salvation. And I need your freedom from sin at all times. And I just ask that you would turn each of our hearts to you. And turn each of our eyes to you, Father, and that we would be different. That this place would be different, Father, and the world would see a difference in us. Father, we need you. We need you to make us different. Father, And we just ask that you give us a heart to serve you and a heart to live for you. And that each person that comes in contact with us, Father, sees something different. I'm tired. I'm tired of, I just don't want sin in my life. I don't want sin inside any of our lives, Father, because, Father, we desire your spirit. and We desire to be close to you. We just love you, and we thank you for the Sabbath day. In your son's name we pray.